Okay, everybody in the house, come over to the Gutenberg stage because I'm going to tell you lots of fascinating information, which some of you might find useful. Absolutely, thank you very much. Um, right, how is everyone? Good, fantastic. Let's put this up a bit. A little bit over here. I want to be able to speak into this microphone. Um, guys, does this work as well? Hello? Yeah, this could work. Um, right, very, very simple. We're going to talk about how you scale off in Europe. It's quite difficult. Uh, it's, uh, we are hugely complex in our European environment. We're not one big homogenous uh, place. Let me explain. It's a big problem. Lots and lots of dif different uh, markets. This is Silicon Valley. You can drive down the 101 highway. You can uh, hit up lots and lots of companies. You can speak to lots and lots of VCs very, very quickly. Uh, it's very easy. And they have 50 years of history since the development of the Manhattan Project in the 1940s and the 1950s, the atomic bomb that ended World War II, the development of the military industrial complex in, uh, in Southern California, and the, uh, the uh, electronic industry from Fairchild onwards to IBM, you name it. This is very, very simple. It's a very big area, but it's one place. And this is one big, juicy market, very easy to get hold of. They all speak the same language, the plugs work the same, very simple. This is us, very difficult, very, very complex, lots of different territories, lots of uh, different languages, lots of different rules and regulations. You will all know this, very simple, everyone understands it. So how do we do it from here? How do we actually do this? Well, it's very simple. You've got to think smart, you've got to get with the program. You've got to get amongst other entrepreneurs. You've got to coalesce in clusters. Clusters around Europe are forming right now. They have been over the last couple of years. And you've got to find your people, find your tribe. I think, and this is a controversial thing, but I don't think you should say where you're from. I think you should talk about what you do. If you're trying to solve a real problem, then the problem you're trying to solve should be applicable to all markets anywhere at any time, pretty much. It's not, unless you're doing a, uh, a something from you know, an Amazon clone, you want to just want to sell clothes, uh, you just want to sell gadgets or something, you want to reproduce the success of ASOS in one particular market, fine, you can clone a company, but if you want to do big scale thinking, if you want to do something original, then you want to think about removing your location info, don't worry about location, become a platform startup that's actually interesting to pretty much anyone who might visit. For instance, here's an example, Seismic. Now, does anyone know where Seismic was built? I don't think anybody does, right? Seismic was actually PR'd and marketed in the United States, but globally as a social platform. Initially as a video platform, and then later on as a way to interact with social networks like Twitter, Facebook, etc but nobody cared where it was built. Actually, it was built in almost entirely in Romania, but it was never pitched as a Romanian startup. It was pitched as a platform startup, answering a real problem, answering a need. Nobody cared where it was from. It was all about what problem it was solving. And that's the kind of thing that we should think about doing in Europe. Don't wear your heart on your sleeve. Don't wear a British flag or a Spanish flag or whatever you want to do. Think about the problem you're trying to solve and the customers and the clients and the, the users that you're trying to solve a problem for. Very simple. Emphasize the product. It's all about the product. It's all about what problem you're trying to solve for your users. That's what you've got to hone in on laser focused, laser focused. And you also um, got to get traction in a market that you understand. So it's, you don't necessarily have to go be all things to all people from the word go. You can also go for a market that you understand and test the product and work out what actually works. Now, a really fantastic example of this uh, was Spotify. Now, Spotify, we heard about uh, Spotify when we were on TechCrunch a few years ago. Suddenly, we heard about a great party going on in Stockholm. 
And we were like poof, bringing up people going, what's going on? Why is there such an enormous party going on in Stockholm? Well, it turned out that Sto uh, Spotify had raised $70 million and told nobody about it. And Daniel Eek, it actually looks like Eck, but it's pronounced Eek, had raised 70 million bucks from all the major five record labels, totally in stealth, spent two years on a plane, but going from Los Angeles to San Francisco to New York to London, speaking to all the major record labels and all the major venture capitalists about how he wanted to disrupt iTunes and solve the problem of file sharing with music. But in order to do that, he had to prove to them that what he was doing would actually work. And the way he did that was by creating a Spotify, which initially was only in Sweden. And nobody really thought that that was that big a deal. Sweden was not, you know, only 9 million people in Sweden. Uh, but in fact, Sweden had an enormous file sharing problem. Kazar was actually disrupting the entire music industry in Sweden. Everyone was downloading everything else and they had a real problem to solve. So he tested that market first, tested Spotify. All the whole thing was in Swedish. But as soon as he realized that he had traction and he had a real, answering a real user need, he then realized it was something he could actually scale internationally. And that's what he did. Now, you could do this in any market. You don't have to do it in the UK. You don't have to appeal to everyone in the UK. You can go for a niche. You can solve the problem of women trying to find clothes that fit them, or men trying to buy cars, or do it something in something a niche that people understand. But if you solve that niche, you can solve it in a global way. And if you're in a place like, I don't know, a small country in Europe, like Croatia or Slovenia or something like that, you can solve it in that market, and then you can scale internationally. So that's one way of doing things. Now, once you're actually, you've proved your model and you've got some traction, don't, don't stay wedded. Think about how you can always scale. You, you, don't, you, you need to be ruthless about it. You, you, you can't just think, oh my god, well, wow, fantastic. I'm the biggest thing in the Netherlands. Fantastic. Netherlands, unfortunately, is not a very big market. It's a wealthy market, but it's not very big. But if you're solving a real user need and you've got traction in that user market, think bigger. Why not, right? What we're talking about here at the moment is the third industrial revolution. It's not, in the late 19th century, people were running in front of motor cars with red flags. Now, do you want to be the person who's satisfied with that? No. You want to be the person who says, Forget the, guy, the boy with the red flag in front of the motor car. Let's make the motor car go faster. And that's exactly what you need to think about when you're being an entrepreneur and starting up, especially from Europe. This is something I always believe, that 50% of being a startup is about communication. If you can't actually explain to somebody in simple terms what you're doing, doing why you're doing it, who you're doing it with, the team that you're actually doing it with, what experience you might have had before, your skills, how you're able to start this up, how you're actually able to scale, then you're, got, you're getting nowhere. You're not going to be able to talk to the press. You're not going to be able to talk to the media. You're not going to be able to talk to anybody. So always think about communication. The reason why people talk about pitching and startups is, um, is that you always have to have several different versions of your elevator pitch, as it were. You have to have your 30-second pitch that somebody says, what do you do? And you give them 30 seconds of what it is you're doing. And then you have to have the sort of the two-minute pitch, the sort of slightly longer version, and then a slightly longer version again of about five minutes. And then after that, of course, there's a pitch that you might give to an investor that might be much, much more detailed, involved slide decks, whole meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera but always have versions of your story that you can tell to investors and to media and to anyone who wants to ask what you're doing. So communicate, always communicate. I was just talking to someone earlier who said in one sentence exactly what they were doing. And I think that that's exactly what you want to do from the word go. Get it down to one sentence. When a startup pitches to me, I usually go, oh, so you're the, you know, the X for the Y or the, you do this for this market. Is that right? And I, I send it back to them. And if they actually go, yeah, that's right, you've got it. I know exactly where they're coming from, and they've done their job of being able to tell me what they do, and I've sent it back to them. If the person you're talking to goes, 
yeah, I still don't get it, then you've got to work on your communication. And trying to do a communication piece is important for startups because often you're trying to disrupt a marketplace that, no, that nobody, doesn't know, nobody realizes is ripe for disruption. You're trying to educate a whole new wave of people like investors or the media uh, to understand how you're going to do this. This is something, it might be controversial, but guys, if we're Europeans, we need to think about explaining ourselves in an international language. I'm sorry it's, if it's going to be tough for you to get this, but guys, everybody out there watching this stream, get good at English. This is the international language of technology. It's the international language of investors and of the media. And the bigger, this is the biggest international platform you can understand. Get good at English and you can tell your story. Tell a story, funnily enough. So who are you? Where do you come from? What problem are you solving? Why did you do this? Was it a personal problem that you tried to, to understand, to try to fix? Was it something that, that you yourself found a, a personal, real personal connection with, a problem that you were trying to fix with your, your company? Uh, was it something that happened to you, or was it something that happened to people you knew, or is it a, a market that's a big, fat, juicy market that's going to make a lot of money for a lot of people? Tell a story. Don't st necessarily start with the, the tiny little nugget. Engage people, engage people. And, then, and that's how you'll actually pique people's interest, how they'll get involved. You can always think about aiming for a niche. N niches are always working, whatever you're doing, whether it be consumer, whether it be enterprise, whether it be uh, you name it. Be in, in, in the apps market, uh, there's a lot of health apps right now because co the quantified self is very big right now. That's a niche. Everybody wants to get healthy. Everybody wants a better life for themselves. If an app can game you into a better life, make you lose weight, get you fitter, get you stronger, make, make you pump more iron or, you know, whatever. Aim for a niche. What's Tinder? Tinder is an app that gets you a boyfriend or a girlfriend, right? Fantastic. It's a niche, but it's a big one. So aim for those big niches and go as much into that niche as you can, often. Eventually, you're going to want to raise money, potentially, unless you're making money out of what you're doing. That would be great as well. But if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're not uh, booking revenues and you do need to raise money to scale what you're doing, to hire people, to expand into other markets, to improve your product, then you're going to have to raise money. But the, one of the greatest mistakes that smart startups usually make is that they raise money, raise money too early. They think they've got a product, they think they've got traction, but they're actually nowhere. And they raise money so early that the investor takes a bigger slice of your company than you would like otherwise. What you will actually want to do is to get into a position of strength. When you have strength, you call the shots. You're the other side of the table, and you're negotiating with an investor, and you say, listen, I've proved myself. We've got to a million users. We have 50,000 clients across the world, whatever it is. Whatever it is, if you're in a position of strength, then you're going to be able to negotiate in a much harder terms with the investor. And the way you get strength is by getting traction in your marketplace, in your niche with your startup. And that's how you get to keep control of your company and better control. If you raise too early, then you're going to be giving away more of the company, you'll have less control, and in a very, very sad cases, sometimes you might lose control as well. And that's something you must always think about. Use the tools. They're all out there. AngelList. Just for those of you who don't know, AngelList is where many investors look at startups, Look at the other investors in that startup. Work out if it's something that they want to invest in. Work out if it's uh, uh, something that's actually reputable, whether the team is any good. Things like that. Crunchbase, a little advert for us. Cr TechCrunch runs an uh, a database called Crunchbase. It's entirely free, and it's absolutely fantastic resource. You can look at all the startups in London. You can look at. Uh, uh, you can look at all sorts of information about startups and other people in startups. And uh, 
by the way, I didn't add there, there's a fantastic website you should also look at called Seed Table. Seed Table is based on Crunchbase data. It's pulling the API of the uh, Crunchbase platform, and that's also fantastic as well, seedtable.com. It's done by a hacker, totally on the API. LinkedIn, use LinkedIn. Who's connected to who? Who's, in, who, who's friends with who on LinkedIn? A lot of people are friends with each other on Facebook, whatever. LinkedIn is often uh, much more of a powerful way of working out the connections between uh, people. And you can promote what you're doing, especially if you're doing a business application. Facebook, of course, fantastic. Get your Facebook page and get your Twitter account and, and et cetera, et cetera. It's all, it, all good. Don't, don't necessarily rely on, you, when you're trying to start up, rely on all of these platforms to scale what you're doing in a very cheap, free manner, effectively. Then get on a plane, because especially in Europe, we are very distributed. Here in London, we're very lucky. We've got a very large ecosystem of uh, venture capitalists. You go to Mayfair in Berkeley Square, you can hit five VCs, VC firms in a row. You go to Shoreditch or Hoxton, you, you'll meet hundreds of startups plying their wares, places to go to meet people to hire. You can go to Silicon Drinkabout, you can go to Tech Hub, you can go to Google Campus. There's events all over the place. Uh, and as soon as you start plugging into these networks, you can do lots and lots of things. But it, in Europe, if you're not from, if you're in London, and if you're in Berlin, you've got a tack, you can get into the ecosystems where there is money, where there are people that you can hire, and there are people you can network with. Go to events, meet people. In Silicon Valley, when there is events, people just get in a car. In Europe, we've got to get on a plane. So let's get on a plane, get out there, and meet everybody who's in the ecosystem. And that's the way, that's the way you get into this system. Let's take an example of somebody who actually did it. Now, Erpley, I'm not sure if everybody knows what Erpley is. It's an odd name for a company. But Erpley was a very little known startup out of Estonia, out of Tallinn in Estonia. Now, unusually, Tallinn, for some reason, only about two million, only about two million people. Is this still working? Only about two million people in Tallinn. Um, uh, I heard a fantastic story back in the day about, um, about uh, Estonia that uh, uh, in about the 1970s, uh, there was a, uh, a police computer that was delivered to the police station in Tallinn. And uh, it was the size of a room. And they decided to put all of their criminals on a database. And then somewhere along the line, the, the manual was stolen and photostatted as, that, as at, uh, basically how you copied stuff back in the day. Uh, and distributed amongst a bunch of high schools in Tallinn. And, uh, and then what do we get out the end of it about 20 years later? Skype. And um, so Tallinn in Estonia has been a very strange place. It's been a fantastic place to, uh, for technology because it just got into technology early. Now, Erpli came from Esto uh, Estonia, and their story is very interesting. So in 2009, they won Seed Camp. Seed Camp is one of the biggest accelerators, might be the biggest in Europe, certainly one of the highest quality accelerators in Europe. And they launched this, this thing, a retail payment solution for small to medium enterprise businesses. Now, it's aimed at big retailers, it's point of sale, but it meant that you were putting the point of sale in the cloud, instead of it being a um, you know, big point of green screen there, sitting there, you know, the dumb client and sitting there going back to some server somewhere. It was all in the cloud. And basically, they solved a real problem for retailers. But they were from nowhere. They were from Thailand. Who was going to believe them? So at, at launch, they ended up with quite a lot of Thai clients, and they managed to break even. And that's when they started to raise money. So initially, they raised $2 million from Index Ventures, a big VC here in, in London. And they ended up with more users, and now they've got 20,000 users, and they're being used all across Europe and the United States. So that's how you can do it from a small country. You focus in on a niche, you stick to your knitting, you keep going, and eventually you can get there. And that's they got some seed money, and eventually then they raised again much farther down the track when they'd actually built the company. Now, let me give you a little bit of a sort of a down low on what's going, or low down, shall we say, 
uh, on what's going on in the UK. So if you want to raise seed money in Series A capital, here are some companies. Notion Capital, Oct Octopus, Eden, Pentec, ProFounders, Passion. There are many more. You can find them on Crunchbase. You can find them on Seed Table. Uh, there's also others like EC1 Capital. Uh, these guys are all looking at early stage ventures like you guys, and they're all doing due diligence on these startups. Um, this is the way you get into this system. Now, if you go and see these people, pretty much you'll end up with the, co the contact book for the rest of the ecosystem. You go and see them, they say, you're not for us, why don't you go and see this, this firm? And then eventually, if you go around, you can get, the, get there. But always approach investors via other contacts. The best thing to approach investors with is via other people, people that they already know. So if you look at their portfolio companies, you go to their websites, look at their portfolio companies, and go, here's a portfolio company. They look cool. Ring them, ring them up. Do you mind if I come and uh, see you? I'd like an introduction to this, this person. I'm doing this. Go via other people. But going in cold with investors can often not, not work out so well. You want to make a good impression from the word go. In other words, Europe has networks, and you just need to find them. Here's another uh, example. The new kids on the block. All of these guys are actually quite new in the last couple of years. There's uh, Liquid Labs in Hamburg. They're all across Europe, many of them in London. If you're in it Italy, H Farm are doing a lot of interesting stuff. Mind the Bridge in Italy and in the US. Pro Founders, Connect Ventures is a brand new VC, launched just last year. Um, Passion Capital in White Bear Yard, big outfits, uh, very interesting, doing lots of new things. And this has only just happened. You guys are at the start of this. So I've, if you can probably tell, I've been in this a while. So <laughs> take it from me, this is quite new. This has all been happening in the last couple of years. Now, if you want accelerators. Now, accelerators have been a very interesting way of getting into the startup ecosystem. Because accelerators quite create natural clusters. If everybody, if everybody here was in a startup, we could form an accelerator right now. So here's an example of some of them. Seed Camp, I mentioned earlier, Hack Forward in Germany, uh, but across Europe. Uh, Springboard is now Techstars. Uh, there's the Oxygen Accelerator. Uh, they're doing a, uh, they literally just started this year doing stuff in uh, London. And, um, uh, Weira is owned by Telefonica, huge um, outfit. It, uh, obviously, Telefonica, we know all know about these guys putting this thing on, on here. Uh, Hubraum is in Berlin. They're uh, sponsored by uh, Deutsche Telekom. Uh, Startup Sauna is in Helsinki. Uh, Gamma Rebels is in Warsaw. Uh, Le Camping is in uh, Paris. And there's also a new one called The Family. Uh, there's Innovation Warehouse down the road in London. Uh, there's Just Add Red in Shoreditch. Lots and lots of very interesting new accelerators. And they're being added to by things called uh, new accelerators like Makeshift, for instance. So if you want to, if you feel that you, you're not ready yet for, you know, to try and pitch all the VCs yourself, then joining accelerators is a good way of getting into the ecosystem. You can build your network. You can hang out with other people do, going through the same entrepreneurial journey. And it's actually a great way of getting into the ecosystem. And of course, there's lots of co-working all over the place. If you just want to go and hack, if you want to build your company, tons and tons of places. London, Warsaw, Prague, Berlin, you name it. There's co-working spaces all over the place. And these are a great way to also get into the startup and entrepreneurial ecosystem as well. And of course, the great advantage, of course, is that you don't have to give away a percentage of your company. You can actually go there and find out what's going on. So there's lots and lots of noise, but there's lots and lots of noise in particular ecosystems as well. For instance, here in London, we created Silicon Roundabout, but it wasn't just created, it happen happened sort of organically. People were in a particular place at a particular time and realized that they were working uh, on the same kinds of projects. They were all working in technology. You can join that movement relatively easily. Um, this is just a simple map of some of the startups in East London and across the rest of London. And 
You know, it's important to realize that, that you're a real story. If you're in technology right now, you're at the beginning of this next industrial revolution. And it's uh, somebody who's seen the, this revolution for the last few years, uh, more years than I care to remember. It's, it's more exciting to me now than it has been almost than it, than it ever was. And it's, it's a brilliant time to get involved. You know, the real thing is, is that just like Game of Thrones, you're very sexy right now, okay? Just remember that, it's all happening. But importantly, don't, don't be a small visionary. Think big and think how you're going to scale. Always think, keep your eye on the prize, as Martin Luther King might have said. Don't be afraid of tackling big ideas because everybody else is thinking this way as well. What can I say? I hope you thought that was useful. And if we have any questions, let's have some questions. Thanks very much. Do we, are, are you the mic person? We've got a few, hello? We've got a few uh, gifts for the best questions as well. So I'll let you decide. Oh, right, the gifts for the best questions. So, question over here. And when you ask a question, could you say, if you could say um, uh, who you are and what you're doing, then I can sort of, you know, give some feedback. There's this one there. Hi, Mike. Uh, I'm Matt, a uh, student um, slash part-time board member for the Cairo Society. Um, my question to you is, what accelerator program do you think produces the best results? Like with universities and things like that, you kind of know from uh, tradition and from what the media perceives, uh, which is the most prestigious, which you should aim to get into. But, um, you know, what's on the top of that list for accelerators? Okay, let me, let me throw the question back to you. What do you think an accelerator does? Uh, helps me grow. Helps a company grow. Yeah. Helps a company accelerate, okay. So if you, get, if you join in a company and you get that acceleration, you meet a lot of mentors, you meet potential investors, maybe you get to hire new people, you get into the ecosystem, your company grows much faster than it would otherwise have done if you were sitting in your spare bedroom uh, you know, back at home or whatever, hacking away much faster. And then you get to the end of like the three month or the six month or the year long program, whatever the acceleration program is. And then you've, and you've raised maybe some seed money, some angel money. If at the end of that program, you then effectively like the road runner running off the end of the cliff in the cartoons and then drop because it doesn't go anywhere. You don't get that hockey stick effect. Then it's not an accelerator, is it? The thing about accelerators is it's, you've always got to think about what happens after the accelerator. Don't just think about in the heat of the moment, it's like going back to college or school and it's so much fun and everybody's having a great time and loads of parties and stuff like that. At the end of the day, the accelerator is going to finish. You're going to be out the door. Perhaps it's going to cut. Sometimes it's the kind of accelerator that says, listen, you've got that desk for three months. If you haven't raised money after three months, you're out. And that's the thing is you've got to think about what happens afterwards. And you, you've got to look towards the accelerators that have a consistent track record of raising money, allowing their companies, and also helping their companies to raise money afterwards, after the acceleration process. So the companies that, many of the companies I list there, just on these slides, uh, you put it this way, I didn't put the evil ones on there. <laughs> I didn't, there aren't any bad ones. Most of those are good. In fact, pretty much all of them are good. And, uh, You've got to remember that what happens after the acceleration process, after the accelerator, what happens? And that's the thing. Follow on funding for any startup is incredibly important. So you look at the track record, you look at the companies that they've done, the, what the data they release. For instance, if, if, you, if they say to you, uh, uh, please join our accelerator program, you say, okay, uh, can you give me some data about the, the company? How much equity do you take? What, do, what sort of funding is it? Uh, how many startups have exited as a result of your, your acceleration process? How many have gone on to raise follow-on funding? At what's the percentage? Is it an 80%? Is it 60%? What is it? And you've got to ask those kinds of questions. If you get decent answers back, and you also go ask around, uh, and you can ask journalists as well like me, then you'll get some good answers. And that's the answer. Hi, Mike. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, this is a bit of a personal question for, m for myself. Um, I'm currently yes, you should ditch her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm currently starting a blog um, profiling young startups. And I just want to 
get the biggest, as a, as a technology journalist, what's your biggest advice on doing something like that and trying to get, um, number one, get good content, number two, raise, raising the profile of your blog or whatever? You want to you wanna, you wanna become the next TechCrunch? No, it's, I'm, I'm providing something different. You want to write about startups? Yeah. Um, just do a lot of work, drink a lot of coffee, don't go to bed, <laughs> go to a lot of parties, get a lot of content, get the gossip, act like a journalist, dude. That's the way it works. <laughs> Thanks. I'll talk to you later, but that, you know, it's very, very simple. You've got to turn up every day. You've got to write every day. It's as simple as that. I was going to ask, do you have any advice on where best to find tech co-founders? Or any sites you'd recommend or just networking? Or This is actually a, a question that's happening a lot, especially in London at the moment. A lot of people with ideas and a lot of people with ideas who can't, don't know how to execute. And there's a fantastic blog post out there like, um, uh, how do I find my, you know, my technical co-founder? And the answer is, is that the technical co-founder doesn't want to be found. If the technical co-founder is out there, then and if they're smart enough and they're good enough, they're already doing something themselves, right? Um, it's very, very simple. You've got to, one of the things I think a lot about technology people is that they're much closer to artists and creatives than they are to the traditional view of IT people and you know, tech people. You know, the traditional, the traditional view of technology people is the, is the IT support guy who comes to your desk and says, did you switch it off and on again? You know, and that's crap, right? This, uh, when you're in this world, in the entrepreneurial technology startup world, you're not in that world anymore. You're in a world really of creatives. And if you can excite an engineer about your vision and your ability to execute and your ability to raise money, to talk to investors, to PR, to talk to the media, to do the kinds of things that engineers necessarily themselves are not so interested in, then that's what you can do. Now, in a practical sense, uh, it's hard, but you've got to kind of hang out with a lot of geeks, yeah? One of the problems I see, especially in London, but across Europe and other places, is that entrepreneurs are going to hanging out with other entrepreneurs. Well, if you want to found a company, go and find some damn talent. Go to Hacker News, uh, the Hacker News evenings. Go to GitHub meetups. Go to PHP meetups. You know, go and find people who want to, you know, build things and go, you know, okay, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I've got some, you know, spare time or you mean you've raised a seed round? I, already, I want to lose, leave my job at the bank. I'm joining, you know? So go and hang out with the geeks, people, you know? And these are the creatives. These are the engineers who are building the future. And you're not going to find your technical co-founder at a nice uh, warm glass of wine meetup where there are lots of other entrepreneurs who are also looking for other technical co-founders. So that's, all I, that's the best advice I can give you. Next up. Hi, Mike. I'm Jo. I run a startup called High Street Fit Finder. Yeah. And I was wondering, how does being a social enterprise affect raising funds? Um, you're, 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 you're set up as a social enterprise, not as a limited company type thing? Uh, you can't set yourself up as a social enterprise. Um, so at the moment, I'm a for-profit that gives away some of my profit to charity. Uh, OK. Um, well, I think probably the interesting example of this is something like Just Giving, uh, who, who managed to scale what they were doing. But um, they're typically, I'm sorry to break this news to you, but typically investors, if you want to raise money, is that the question? Raising money or? Yeah, so for instance, raising money, if you're a company that's giving away part of your profits to charity, then investors, although it's extremely laudable and it's a worthy idea, investors themselves are going to be jealous of that money. And they're going to be jealous of the fact that the startup that they've invested in is giving away some of its money. Really what they want the startup to do is laser-like focus, stick to their knitting, stick to the plan, keep their eyes on the prize, and invest the revenues that they're making, if they're making any revenues, into the company to make the company bigger. And, and because I've inv if I've invested, I'm an angel investor and I've given you 20 grand or 50 grand or whatever it is, um, and you're giving away some of your profits, I don't want you to do that. I want you to reinvest that money into scaling your startup bigger so that you as a founder get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, my 
investment in you becomes va more valuable, more and more valuable. Now, if eventually in four years' time, because it's going to take a while, this, these things don't take, this, this doesn't happen in six months, okay? This takes a while. And investors and entrepreneurs get together in a, way, in a very, very similar way, like marriage. Um, it's a big deal. You're going to be together for a lot, long time, so you're going to have to get along. And if in four, five, six years' time, or seven years' time, or some technology companies have taken 20 years to exit, if at the end of that process, you've made a lot of money, your investors have made a lot of money, then go and give the money to charity. Go do what you want with your own personal money. Reinvest. What do you think uh, uh, Zuckerberg has done, uh, or uh, many of the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley have done? They've, take, they've spent millions in uh, charitable donations. Uh, but they didn't do that when they were building their company. They did it when they exited and when they'd made some money. That's kind of the way the, U the US ecosystem works. And I think that's something that you should think about particularly. Now, if you're, what you're doing is uh, very, very laudable, but it becomes very difficult for an investor to think hard about a company that actually effectively is a kind of a quasi-charity. So I think about that. We've got some more questions. Fantastic. Over here. Uh, hello, my name, my name is Michal. I'm from Central Europe, from uh, Slovakia. And uh, we build a program for uh, young geeks, uh, for the young technologists. And uh, right now we are going to build the whole environment of the collaboration offices and hacker spaces, uh, which, uh, in, in which we will, uh, and we will run uh, startups from it. Uh, what do you think about the, um, the government programs for a funding? Government for programs? Funding, yeah. So, what do you um, think about it? Like the Jeremy Fund and things like that? Yeah, Jeremy yeah, Funding so and all this stuff. So there's lots of stuff going around in Europe. You can get EU funds and things like that. So really, um, if there are government programs, fine, grab them because they're virtually free money. They tend not to want their money back. They, want, uh, they tend not to want uh, much interest. If you can get grants and God knows what else, go for it. Frankly practically free cash. The trouble is you're going to have to go through a lot of pain, a lot of paperwork, and a lot of red tape to fill that out. The question is how fast you want to move. If you want to move quickly, f ignore the government people, ignore the public sector. They're always too slow. They make decisions incredibly badly. Uh, they don't know how technology works or how the technology ecosystem works. Avoid them like the plague if you want to move quickly. If you've got all the time in the world, fine. Fill out the forms, get the money, and go. Uh, that's what I would say. Um, simple. But if, you, if you're setting something up, go for it. I think I'll come and visit you when you set it up. Okay, next, next one. Hello. Um, I've got a, a video production company, but I just wanted to know, from the, in terms of the technology ecosystem that you were talking about beforehand, where would you place crowd fundraising like Kickstarter and Indiegogo? Yeah. So this is very interesting. Over the last couple of years, we've seen um, crowdfunding platforms arise like Indiegogo, uh, Kickstarter, uh, in the UK, Crowdcube, lots of different kinds of uh, uh, p crowdfunding platforms. The question is, there are two different types, and there's a new one, uh, newer ones called Crowd Equity. Uh, Cedars, S-E-E-D-R-S uh, dot com, is a crowd equity platform where you invest in the company and you get a slice of the company. The question is, did you want to give Mark Zuckerberg in 2004 um, 50 bucks, so he gave you a premium Facebook account, and then, and he, then he ends up exiting for billions of dollars, or do you want to give him uh, 50 bucks and you get 1% of Facebook? Okay, so these are different kinds of platforms. Um, crowdfunding in terms of Kickstarter and Indiegogo, where you raise money, effectively, what you're doing is um, that the old model has changed. In the industri industrial revolution, you, you designed a product, you made a product, and then you went out onto the streets and you sold the product via distributors, retailers, you know, back in the day, on the street yourself. Now, the new model with crowdfunding platforms is you, make the, you, you, you design the product and you sell the product before you've even made something on these platforms. Then, you sell the product to a fantastically qualified number of people already, and then you make the product. Uh, and then you bring up your manufacturer in China that says, right, start the, start the presses, start rolling. And this is fantastically revolutionary. So, and in particular, it's become extremely important for hardware-based startups. 
For some reason, it's, it's, it's worked much better in hardware startups than it has with software, because it's something you can get your hands, your hands on. Uh, it's a product that people feel that they can invest their uh, confidence in. The Pebble Watch famously raised $10 million on the Kickstarter platform, uh, uh, because well, the company had made watches before, and now they wanted to make one which was connected to the iPhone and the Android, and then, so they had a provenance in this. And then everyone believed them, 10 million bucks later, off they go. Um, but software, games, lots of, I see lots of startups saying, yeah, we're going to do a startup for, I don't know, mobile social software or something, and we're going to do a Kickstarter campaign. It's not necessarily going to work. You've got to go for something that's going to you know, excite people. Uh, and also, the important thing is when you're raising on crowdfunding funding platforms, is not to set the bar so high that, uh, that you, you, A, you don't get there, and B, don't set it so low so that you, you've only raised like five grand and you've still got to deliver a product. That's a problem. So it's a very difficult way. It's a, it's, it's a tricky way to, uh, uh, to do a startup, uh, but it's a good platform to actually gauge interest in the product that you're doing. Next, next question. I think we might be running out of time any minute. Don't, uh, don't ask me to do Q&A because I'll wrap it on forever. Hey, Go Mike. On. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, based on your experience with TechCrunch, uh, big fan, by the way, is um, what were the biggest difficulties you had in uh, you know getting the the platform you know the the site uh, to the people you know just getting out there? What are the main difficulties that you know you've seen in that aspect? Well, I think that with TechCrunch, you we you know it's a, it's an unusual brand because it was started by Mike Arrington, who was an, a former lawyer who spent a year on a beach in California, went back to Silicon Valley, and then started blogging. And his next lawyer knew technology and wanted to invest. Now he he actually didn't want to be a media person; he just started blogging. And he was the right man in the right place at the right time. It's a classic story. Now, if you're uh, and, and he was in the Silicon Valley when technology was re, you know exploding once again. Now, if you're going to do startups, if you're going to do a startup blog um, from anywhere in the world, go after what your niche is. You know, focus on when there, where there's a need. Don't just be the n another Me Too uh, media platform I in a marketplace. Uh, uh, go, out, uh, you know, go for a niche and, and go for something that people really aren't really being served well by, and then and then stay up all night, basically blogging all night and all day. It's very simple. Lots and lots of sweat. Next up. Uh, hi, Mike. My name's uh, Matthew. Could you just repeat the list of the places that it's good for people who aren't techie that are looking for their tech codes to go to to speak to? Because I didn't quite manage to get those down. Um, Did I do a list? I'm not well, sure. there was a couple. You said about Hack News and their events, just that those kind of things as um, examples of places to be able to go to find the engineers who are hiding a little bit to be able to have a chat with them. Because my problem is, is that yeah. I'm not the techie person, yeah. but I find it very easy to, if it's a great idea, get on board and be the person that can sell and go. And I don't mind talking to people and, and telling them what the idea is yeah. and getting the money in. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it's finding those ideas that I can really get enthusiastic about and join well, the Ma teams Matthew, and get in. Please meet the lady in front of you well, who asked exactly the same question <laughs> earlier. And then, because you're both uh, co-found, your founders, you could maybe swap notes on, on this. Uh, now, uh, there's <laughs> it's really very, very simple. Um, shortly, actually, in the next uh, couple of weeks, I'll be publishing on TechCrunch a guide on how to get into the London technology startup scene for everybody who's kind of new to the scene, I think. And uh, what I want to make sure is that uh, you guys get into the right kind of scene rather than turning up where there's a bunch of uh, recruitment consultants or something. Like, uh, no offense, recruitment consultants, but you know, um, you know, where there's a bunch of people who aren't really doing anything. They're just kind of there to sell to you. Uh, so I want to give you, I'll give you a, a bunch of lists, but if you want to do some research right now, just Google, uh, just go on to meetup.com and you start going through all of the technology meetups in London. And I'll tell you now, there are so many, it's ridiculous. I was just going through uh, myself. And I, and I think if you have a, you know, some technical knowledge yourself, uh, then, then go to the meetups specific to those technology meetups like Ruby on Rails or whatever it is. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and yeah, and, and just go and do a lot of research. You can do a lot of online research and find those meetups where all the tech people are and, and go, go along. Ask lots of questions. Ask that question over and over again, many, many times, all the meetups, and you'll find the people. And what can I say, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to get into this space, if you want to do a startup, if you want to be an entrepreneur, kiss lots of frogs, talk, have lots of conversations, uh, don't believe anybody for at least until you're at least six months in and then start building something. That's what I, was, I would say. 
Um, but start quickly, because this is the right time now. It's the right time. I believe it's the right time. So I hope you enjoyed some, time, some of this, and uh, I'll be available for a, a couple of minutes after this uh, if you want to have any more questions. Thanks very much.